Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Lassiv lecture series from Oman Diabetes Association. This series number uh, nine. The aim of this uh, lecture series is to improve the knowledge and skill of healthcare professionals in caring for a diabetic patient. Diabetes is uh, a very common disease. <clears throat> what I want to say is diabetes is uh, a very costly disease. It affects all parts of the body. It is very damaging unless you get controlled and complications get identified early. So today we are discussing one of the important domain of diabetes complications. Uh, that we all should work together to prevent it, identify it early and prevent it. Our topic today is about diabetic food or what you need as a healthcare professional working in primary healthcare. It's very uh, important, um, very important place where you are sitting at the level of primary healthcare. It's the place where you identify uh, important uh, signs that if you identify them early, you can easily uh, prevent serious complication. <clears throat> so we as a healthcare, a healthcare professional working in primary healthcare, we should work hardly in order to identify these patients, diagnose them early, refer them early if required to prevent amputation of diabetic food. So our speaker today, our guest speaker is today is Mrs. Wissam Aryami. Ms. Wissam is a podiatrist at uh, National Diabetic and Crime Center in Muscat, and she will talk about uh, diabetic food. Before we start, we'd like to thank our sponsor for this evening, Delhi Company, Sharqiya uh, Company Holding, and Body Rolling. Also, if you have any questions, you can put it in the Q&A uh, section, or you can raise your hand at the end so you will be allowed to speak directly to the speaker. So without further ado, I will ask our guest speaker to start her talk. Sam, thank you very much, and the floor is yours. Assalamu uh, alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, the Diabetes uh, Association for uh, giving me this opportunity. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Um, so uh, my lecture today is going to be um, uh, diabetic foot, uh, all you need to know uh, as a healthcare provider. Uh, my name is Wissam Riyami. I'm a podiatrist at the National Diabetes and Endocrine Center. Okay, so diabetic foot uh, is a huge uh, topic, um, but uh, I tried to summarize the main, uh, the most important uh, points. Uh, you, as a primary health care provider, should be able to identify and uh, know. So first of all, I'll uh, talk about, I'll uh, define diabetic foot. I'll go through some uh, background facts about diabetic foot, and then we'll go through the pathophysiology, and then um, we'll uh, quickly summarize the assessment and uh, assessment tools and uh, management techniques. Um, so we'll start with the definition. Uh, so the diabetic foot uh, may be defined as infection, ulceration, or destruction of tissues of the foot associated with neuropathy and or peripheral arterial disease in the lower extremity of a person with a history of diabetes mellitus. Background facts, uh, diabetic foot ulcers are complex, chronic wounds, which have a major long-term impact on the morbidity, mortality, and quality of patients' lives. Uh, individuals who develop a diabetic foot ulcer are at a greater risk for premature death, myocardial infarction, and fatal stroke than those without a history of diabetic foot ulcers. Uh, around uh, 15 to 25% of uh, people with diabetes will develop a diabetic foot ulcer during their lifetime. 
Um, the development and progression of a diabetic foot ulcer is complicated by neuropathy, vascular disease, along with altered neutrophil function, diminished tissue perfusion, and defective protein synthesis. Okay. Um, it has been estimated that every 30 seconds, somewhere in the world, a lower limb is amputated due to complication of diabetes. Uh, in England, foot complications account for around 20% of the National Health uh, Service spent on diabetes care. So, um, so that equates to around uh, 65, um, uh, six, 650 million uh, pounds per year. These figures do not take into account the indirect costs of patients, such as the effect on physical, psychological, social well-being, and uh, many patients are unable to work for uh, long term as a result of their uh, ulcers. Uh, mortality following amputation increases with the level of amputation and ranges from 50 and up to 68% at five years, which is comparable or worse than most malignancies. And this is the point where most people uh, don't realize, and it's quite uh, worrying, is that if a person uh, goes uh, gets an amputation, then their uh, mortality rate is comparable to most cancers. So uh, this was a study by, uh, done by um, uh, Wound, uh, Wounds International in 2013. Uh, so you can see that um, if a person has a new, uh, neuropathic diabetic foot ulcer, the relative five-year mortality, mortality rate is at 46%. Uh, if uh, they have an ischemic diabetic foot ulcer, that mortality rate jumps up to 66%. Another study, which was done in uh, 2020 by uh, David Armstrong, who is the guru of uh, diabetic foot, um, showed that uh, if you, have a, if you uh, develop a diabetic foot ulcer, then your five-year mortality rate is around, is around 30%. Um, whereas if you have, uh, if you compare it to all types of cancer, it's almost similar. And if that diabetic foot ulcers uh, progresses into a minor amputation, then the mortality rate goes up to around um, 48%. And then if you, you get, uh, if the patient goes into major amputation, such as below knee amputation or above knee amputation, then the rate will jump up to uh, almost 68%. Okay. So uh, the uh, relative five-year mortality rate is higher for diabetic foot uh, ulcer with a critical limb and ischemia or a major amputation is higher than all types of cancers pulled together except lung cancer. Okay. So um, now we'll go into the pathophysiology of diabetic foot. So uh, diabetic foot ulcers may have multiple causes, but the most prominent ones being uh, first the peripheral neuropathy, which is uh, nerve damage, and then the peripheral vascular disease, which is the poor uh, blood supply to the uh, feet. And the third cause is trauma. So a trauma can be either acute or chronic. Acute is uh, being any in injury to the foot, such as uh, burns or cuts. Uh, chronic trauma is, uh, can be due to deformities leading to minor repetitive trauma and thereby ulceration. And I'll go through these uh, individually in detail. So this is the diabetic foot triad. So you have a person with diabetes. Um, they develop neuropathy uh, and ischemia or poor blood supply. And then uh, you they, um, they develop immunopathy as well due to diabetes. And if you add to that combination trauma, whether it was acute trauma or uh, chronic trauma, and then what happens is they develop a diabetic foot ulcer. This is another uh, illustration uh, which shows uh, the patho, uh, the diabetic foot pathway, uh, patients who develop uh, neuropathy, um, and then with the minor repetitive trauma, 
they get uh, callus formation. And if you add into, uh, if you add into that uh, peripheral arterial disease, what happens is they uh, develop uh, subcutaneous hemorrhage, which eventually opens up into a chronic ulcer. Okay, so we'll explain about uh, neuropathy. Okay, uh, first of all, there's three types of neuropathy. We have sensory neuropathy, uh, motor neuropathy, and then we have autonomic neuropathy. Sensory neuropathy, uh, what we mean by sensory neuropathy, neuropathy is the loss of protective sensation in the feet. So it starts uh, distally at the toes and migrates proximally. Proximally, so uh, mainly patient, uh, patients uh, first lose their sensation in the toes, and then the uh, loss of sensation migrates proximally more towards the heel and ankle area. Um, we have uh, two types of nerve fibers. Uh, we have uh, sensory fibers. We have the large fibers and the small nerve fibers. If the person uh, loses uh, sensation in the large nerve fibers, they, you, they lose sensation of light touch and proprioception. If uh, we have small nerve uh, fiber loss, then the person loses their, sense, uh, their pain and temperature sensation. And usually it's a combination of uh, both. Uh, we rarely find uh, patients who just have uh, a neuropathy of one type of nerve uh, fiber. Okay. Then there's uh, motor neuropathy. Uh, motor neuropathy mostly causes uh, forefoot ulceration. Uh, what happens is there's uh, intrinsic muscle wasting, so it, um, you, they develop uh, um, deformities such as clawed toes, or uh, you can have the equinus contracture, which is the contraction of the um, uh, calf muscle, which causes uh, um, reduced range of motion of the ankle, which leads to more pressure towards the forefoot. So these are the examples of the uh, deformities uh, due to uh, motor neuropathy. So you have, this is an example of uh, uh, clawed toes. So you can have uh, pressure there and develop an ulcer there at the uh, dorsum of the toe. Or you can, um, and then there's a hallux abducto valgus, which is uh, more commonly, commonly known as bunions. And then you have a charcoal foot. So this is a charcoal foot uh, where you have uh, destruction of bones. And then uh, mostly uh, you get the deformity of uh, in the midfoot, midfoot deformity. So this is a photo of a patient. Uh, with the charcoal foot. So there you can see the midfoot uh, joint uh, destruction. And this is another photo from the dorsum, as you can see. Um, and there he developed an ulcer on the top, uh, on the dorsum of the fourth toe as well. Okay. Uh, this is the uh, hammer toes uh, due to. Um, motor neuropathy, these types of de deformities can happen. So uh, the hammer toe, the, uh, the patient usually develops ulcers at the uh, dorsum of the uh, in, uh, in IPJ. And with clawed toes, they can develop ulcers at the metatarsal head and the plantar aspect due to the pro prominent metatarsal head and they develop ulcers as well on the dorsum of the uh, interphalangeal joint. And they can develop uh, ulcers at the apex of, um, apex of the toe. Uh, this is a uh, hallux valgus deform deformity. And usually we see ulcers at the medial aspect of the metat first metatars metatarsal due to this deformity. So this is what happens. Let's say the patient has a, uh, this is a clawed toe. So there's excessive pressure at the, um, at the first metatarsal head, which causes uh, callus formation. And then uh, subcutaneous hemorrhage happens due to the excessive pressure, the tissue breaks down or the skin breaks down under the callus at this stage, usually the patient is not aware of uh, an ulcer underneath uh, the callus. 
So eventually that tissue breaks, the callus breaks down and uh, the ulcer uh, opens up. And what happens is due to the ulcer being there for a long time, but it's, uh, uh, it's not clear due to the callus formation, uh, the patient quickly develops a deep tissue infection and osteomyelitis. And then the third type of uh, neuropathy is autonomic neuropathy. Uh, so the autonomic nervous uh, system regulates sweating and pro um, profusion to the limb. So if you, you have a loss of autonomic control, uh, it uh, inhibits thermoregulatory function and sweating. So what happens is uh, you get uh, dry, scaly, and stiff skin that is prone to cracking and allows a uh, portal of entry for bacteria. So it's very important for people with diabetes to maintain their skin integrity by uh, daily moisturizing. Okay. Uh, this is just uh, uh, another uh, illustration that shows the pathway of uh, motor, sensory, and autonomic uh, neuropathy. Um, so if you have motor neuropathy, you have muscle wasting and then foot weakness and postural deviation, uh, which leads to deformity, excessive uh, stress to the tissue and shear pressure, which leads to an ulcer. Uh, sensory neuropathy as well, uh, they, you get uh, loss of proprioception and awareness of foot position, and uh, as well as uh, loss of uh, sensation, which leads to callus formation. Uh, and eventually an ulcer. Autonomic neuropathy, you have reduced sweating, uh, dry skin, which leads to fissures and cracks, and then an ulcer, okay? Uh, we'll move on to uh, the second cause of uh, diabetic uh, foot ulcers, which is uh, peripheral arterial disease. So high blood pressure expedites atherosclerosis, which leads to peripheral uh, vascular disease, which is the redu reduction of uh, blood supply to the foot. So the delivery of essential nutrients and oxygen to the foot is compromised, leading to anaerobic uh, infections and tissue necrosis. So if you have a peripheral arterial disease and you get uh, atherosclerosis, which is a narrowing of the uh, arterial lumen, which leads to uh, uh, ischemia of the tissue, foot ischemia, which might lead to uh, necrosis or gangrene. Or if the patient develops a diabetic foot ulcer, then this ulcer, if it gets infected, then it will develop into a necrosis or gangrene due to the uh, loss of uh, oxygen and nutrients to the tissue. Uh, the third cause of uh, diabetic foot ulcer is uh, trauma. So uh, we have acute trauma, as I mentioned before, we have two types of trauma, acute trauma and chronic trauma. Uh, acute trauma is what we mean by acute trauma is abrasions and burns due, uh, occur due to uh, the absence of nociception, which is the sensation. Uh, poor wound healing makes ulceration more likely to occur. So if a patient walks barefoot on a hot surface or Perhaps they, uh, they are wearing inappropriate footwear. Uh, they get cuts, abrasions, burns, and then uh, this leads to a diabetic foot ulcer. Or it can be caused by chron chronic trauma, which is uh, due to um, uh, the motor neuropathy, which creates uh, the classical deformed foot uh, shapes. And these deformities results in bony prominence, prominences, which when coupled with high mechanical pressures on the underlying, uh, overlying skin uh, can result in ulceration. Okay, uh, now we'll move on to uh, diabetic foot assessment. Uh, I hope the pathophysiology was uh, clear. If someone has a question, please put it in the um, question box and I'll move into the diabetic foot assessment. Okay, so as a primary healthcare uh, professional uh, or a primary healthcare provider, whom, whom do you need to assess and why do you assess? Actually, all patients with diabetes or all people with diabetes needs to be, uh, their feet needs to be assessed annually, at least annually. 
uh, and that is to evaluate the individual's risk of developing uh, a foot complication and hence uh, plan their management. Okay, so we don't wait until the patient develops an ulcer to assess him. As soon as the patient is diagnosed with diabetes, we have to uh, make a foot assessment as part of their, um, their uh, plan, assessment plan. Okay. So how do we assess? Uh, first of all, of course, we have to um, uh, ask the patient about uh, the, if they have any complaints, uh, take their history, uh, their history of diabetes, any other medical or diabetes related complications. We have to, uh, this is very impo important, we have to ask them about their previous ulceration or amputation or uh, surgeries in their foot. Uh, we have to check for uh, any current ulceration or a history of their current ulceration. We have to assess and check their footwear and we have to assess their ability to self-care. Okay, so we'll start with the vascular assessment. So first of all, we have to check, all, uh, we have to check for risk factors for a peripheral, uh, peripheral vascular disease, such as smoking, high blood pressure, uh, hyperlipidemia, uh, CVD, advancing age, or previous vascular surgeries, or their lifestyle. And then we ask them if they have uh, any symptoms of vascular disease, such as uh, intermittent claudication. Uh, what we mean by intermittent claudication is um, if the patient gets any pain and their uh, pain or tightening in their calf muscles as they walk. So you have to ask the patient, do you walk? How long do you walk? Um, if they say like, if we cannot, we can't walk, uh, then you ask them why you can't walk. Um, Possibly they'll say, because I feel tightening in my calf muscle. And then you ask them how many meters you can walk. So if they complain of tightening in their mus uh, calf muscles when they walk, then that's intermittent claudication. And that's a symptom of uh, peripheral uh, arterial disease. And you have to ask them if they have rest pain, okay? And then check for signs of vascular issues, uh, sh such as thinning skin, shiny skin, uh, reduced hair growth, um, uh, check the color, uh, if there's any redness, uh, darkening of the skin, you check their temperature, is their temperature gradient normal or are the feet cold, and you check for oedema. Uh, after uh, asking the patient uh, uh, about their symptoms and checking their signs, what we do next is uh, palpate their pedal pulses. So we have the dorsalis pedis and uh, posterior tibial uh, arteries. Um, so we palpate them. If we cannot feel them with, their, with our hands, then we, uh, we can use the Doppler ultrasound. So we have to listen to the sound of the Doppler the type, quality, and pitch, and loudness of the sound. So the normal so sound is a triphasic sound, and you can look up on YouTube. Uh, there's lots of videos on YouTube on what's the normal sound and what's the abnormal sound. If the sound is biphasic or monophasic, then that in indicates uh, some uh, vascular issues. So this is the dorsalis pedis artery. Okay, so this is where you find it. If you lift up the uh, first uh, toe, then you have the extender uh, tendon and it's somewhere there. Okay, and uh, you have the posterior tibial artery, which is uh, usually found uh, just behind the medial malleolus. And it's quite easy to find. If you can't find the dorsalis pedis artery, then you can find the anterior tibial artery, which is uh, somewhere uh, here uh, on the dorsum of the ankle joint. Okay. Okay, moving on. Um, let's say that you couldn't find the uh, dorsalis uh, or the pedal pulses with a Doppler or you, um, 
or the Doppler sound was very weak and monophasic. So what you do is the next uh, assessment uh, tool you have is the ankle brachial index. So uh, literature, literature shows that this test is 95% uh, sensitive and 99% specific to uh, peripheral arterial disease. So if, uh, if you do uh, um, an ankle brachial index and the result is more than 1.4, then that's uh, not a normal result. That's usually uh, what we call a non-compressible non uh, uh, artery due to calcification. So in this case, mostly patients um, will have to, uh, will have to uh, um, We'll have to see a vascular surgeon for further assessment, um, maybe a CT angio. Okay, uh, if the uh, if the result is between one to one point four, then that's a totally normal result. Anything below zero point nine is considered abnormal. So if the result is between zero point seven one to zero point nine, that's a mild uh, peripheral arterial disease between 0.41 and 0.7 is moderate disease. Uh, anything below 0.4, then that's a critical limb ischemia or severe arterial disease. So this is how we do um, an ankle brachial index. First of all, we use a pressure cuff and me um, measure the um, brachial systolic pressure, record it. And then um, we put the pressure cuff on the, on the foot, just above the ankle. Uh, we, uh, we, we, we take the systolic pressure of the dorsalis pedis, and then we take the systolic pressure, pressure of the posterior tibial artery as well. And then what we do is we choose the uh, highest value. So let's say the, uh, Posterior tibial was the highest value. For example, here, the posterior tibial was 108. So we take that, uh, and then we divide it by the uh, brachial pressure, and you have the index, OK? OK. After the vascular assessment, um, you assess their uh, perif uh, peripheral nerves, okay? So you do a neurological assessment. Uh, first of all, you have to uh, assess the pressure sensation. Um, so we use a monofilament, a 10 gram, 10 gram monofilament to uh, assess the pressure sensation. Uh, there are four main areas that the patient should be able to feel the monofilament on. Uh, we avoid uh, uh, putting the monofilament in areas of callus buildup. If the patient loses one or more sensation, if the patient can't feel the monofilament in one or more sites, then we consider the patient as he is neuropathic, or, they, or we can say that he has loss of protective sensation. The sensitivity of the monofilament is approximately 90%. So this is the monofilament. I think the monofilament is available in all health centers and all primary health care settings. Uh, they're quite cheap and uh, it's, uh, it's an easy test to do. Okay, so you place the monofilament uh, perpendicular to the skin. You apply pressure until the monofilament buckles. Once you see the monofilament buckles and then you release, and then you just ask the patient if they felt it or didn't feel it. Of course, the patient uh, has to be, um, you have to ask the patient, you have to first try it on their hands so they can know what it feels like. Because most patients, if you show them the monofilament, they'll think that it's a, it's a needle. They will be looking for like a painful sensation. So you have to explain that it's not pain. What you're looking for is just a pressure sensation. And so you apply it on their hands first before applying it on their feet. And then you ask the patient to just close their eyes, relax, and tell you if they feel something. Um, preferably, they have to tell you without you asking. Okay, so they tell you if they feel it on the left, 
left foot or they feel it on the right foot or if they feel it on the dorsum or plantar or where, whatever area you apply it on. Okay, so these are the four main areas that the patient should be able to feel the monofilament on, the first toe and the three metatarsals. And then you can uh, add uh, some other sites. You can add the other toes or the midfoot or the heel or the dorsum of the foot. But um, if the patient can't feel these four sites, any of these four sites, then they are at a risk for ulceration because they have loss of protection, uh, protective sensation. Okay, then there are other tests like the vibration. We use the 128 uh, hertz uh, uh, tuning fork. And then there's a more advanced uh, test, which is the biothesiometer. Okay. After uh, the neurological assessment, um, you can do a biomechanical assessment. Uh, that's uh, just a way of saying, uh, assess them for foot deformities, okay, and check their joints range of motion. So just check if they have any Sharkov, uh, Sharkov uh, joint, if they have a bunion, if they have clawed toes, uh, check if they, the plantar aspect of the foot, if there's any uh, uh, area of excessive pressure. Okay, and check the joints uh, range of motion, the first, uh, first metatarsal and the ankle joint. Uh, after that, you have to check their skin and nails. So you check if there's any tinea uh, between the toes, you have to open up the uh, areas between the toes because tinea's, tinea, uh, tinea infection is very common, unfortunately in our, um, in our area. So you um, have to make sure that the patient uh, does not have tinea um, and check their skin if there's any cracks or any cuts. And then uh, you have to check their nails as well if uh, they're involuted, if they're at risk uh, for uh, an injury from sharp nails or thick nails, okay. So after doing all the assessments, what we do is we uh, put the patients in uh, uh, foot risk categories. So that what we mean by risk is their risk for ulceration or developing a diabetic foot uh, complication. Okay, so um, we have uh, four risk categories. This is, this is according to the International uh, Working Group for Diabetic Foot Guidelines 2019. Um, we have a very low risk for ulceration, low risk for ulceration, moderate risk for ulceration, and high risk for ulceration. So uh, if we assess the patient, of course, the patient with diabetes, and he does not have any loss of protective sensation using the monofilament, their pulses are pal palpable, uh, you decide that he does not or she does not have a peripheral arterial disease and you check for deformities and you don't find any deformity, then we put a pa the, this patient at uh, very low risk for ulceration. Uh, if the patient has diabetes with loss of protective sensation, uh, peripheral arterial disease or a deformity, so one of these, Okay, then the patient is at low risk for, for ulceration. If your patient has diabetes with loss of protective sensation and peripheral arterial disease, so two risk factors, okay, or loss of protective sensation and deformity, or peripheral arterial disease and deformity, so you have diabetes and two risk factors for ulceration, then they are at a moderate risk for ulceration. So if a patient with diabetes and you find out that they have loss of protective sensation or peripheral arterial disease, plus one or more of the following, uh, history, a history of ulceration, a history of amputation and end stage renal disease, then they are at a high risk for, uh, for ulceration. 
okay? So it has to be loss of protective sensation or and or peripheral arterial disease with a history of previous ulceration, a history of amputation, and end-stage renal disease. This puts the patient at a very high risk for ulceration or re-ulceration. Okay. So uh, if a patient is at a very low risk for ulceration, then it is recommended to be at the patient to be uh, reassessed annually. So once a year is enough to reassess their feet. If they're at a low risk for ulceration, then uh, six to 12 months. Um, if they are at a moderate risk, then you have to reassess every three to six months. If they are at a high risk for ulceration, uh, once every one to three uh, months. Uh, of course, this is uh, this screening or reassessment uh, is based on frequency is based on expert opinion, and there's no published da uh, data or evidence uh, to support these intervals. But it's just uh, a recommendation. It depends on case. You you as a healthcare provider, you have to. Um, uh, uh, see what suits the patient best. It's for the judgment is on you how frequent the assessment should be. Okay, so if a patient comes um, with a wound, let's say a patient comes with an ulcer. So what do you do? How do we, I, I assess that wound? So first of all, you have to take a detailed history uh, of that ulcer or that wound, okay? The duration, how long has it been there? Cause, how did it happen? Was it an acute trauma? Was it a uh, chronic trauma? You have to ask the patient if there was any change in the appearance or the size of the wound. Did it become bigger? Uh, is it improving? Um, the number, you have to note down the number of lesions. And you have to ask the patient any uh, history of the same re lesion, okay? Did it happen before? Uh, in, and if there's any pain in that wound. So when you examine uh, the wound, uh, these are the points that you should uh, observe. Uh, first of all, the anatomical site. Is it on a pressure area? Is it on the plantar aspect of the foot? Is it on the dorsum, uh, on the leg, between the toes? Where exactly you have to note down uh, the exact uh, location. Uh, and then you note down the size. You can use, um, you can measure it uh, with, a, uh, with just a, a paper ruler, um, how many centimeters or how many millimeters, because that will help you um, uh, to see if the wound is improving over time. Two minutes, uh, Wisha. Okay. And then the general appearance of the wound, okay. Uh, the sides, uh, the base of the wound, if it's granulating, if there's slough or necrotic tissue, and then if there's discharge, is it pur purulent discharge or is it just thin watery discharge? Okay, so you have, uh, three types of wound, ischemic, venous, and neuropathic, and most wounds are uh, neuroischemic. They, they're both, they're ischemic and uh, neuropathic. These are the different types of wound, uh, venous, neuropathic, and ischemic. So how do you manage? If you find the patient uh, is at a high risk for ulceration, if they have no ulcer, you just educate educate them and reassess regularly. If, uh, if you find an ulcer, what you do is you follow your local diabetic foot protocol and you refer to your local diabetic foot clinic. In terms of uh, education, education is key to prevention. You have to tell the patient and emphasize their daily foot checks, uh, wearing sensible footwear, don't walk uh, barefoot, keep your feet uh, clean and moisturized. Uh, keep the area between the toes dry to avoid any tinea or fungal infection and avoid any heat sources. Uh, cut the nails straight across to avoid and avoid going through the edges to avoid any injuries. So managing an active diabetic foot uh, disease is based on two principles, local management and systemic management. Okay. 
So if you have an active uh, ulcer, what, how we manage it is by debridement, whether it's surgical or bedside debridement, uh, offloading. We use some different types of uh, offloading to relieve pressure if it's on a pressure area and uh, wound management using advanced dressing materials. So this is a case we saw recently at the clinic. As you can see, it's just callus. Uh, the patient is not aware of uh, an ulcer being there. After debridement, you can see that the ulcer is revealed. Okay. This is the different types of uh, offloading uh, devices that we use to relieve pressure from the plantar aspect of the foot. This is a patient we had who had an ulcer here in the forefoot. And we did the felt offloading pad and eventually her wound healed. Um, these are some of the uh, wound dressings that we use at our clinic. So, and then uh, other than local management of the wound, uh, you have to, uh, you have to uh, as, uh, manage uh, their systemic, uh, systemic management. So you have to refer to the appropriate healthcare provider for management of their systemic conditions, such as diabetes has to be controlled. Ischemia, you have to re uh, refer to the vascular surgeon and infection, you have to control that infection. So in conclusion, uh, diabetic foot is a common yet underdiagnosed complication of diabetes. Diabetic foot is a complex and deliberating syndrome which requires a multidisciplinary approach to treatment. Uh, most important uh, point is that uh, education, awareness and regular assessments are the key to prevention. So if we educate the patient and we make them aware about the diabetic foot, and if the uh, healthcare, uh, primary healthcare provider does regular assessment, then uh, we can prevent a lot of complications. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hussam, for this uh, very comprehensive and very clear uh, lecture. I'm sure you will need more time to discuss further details. <laughs> yes. But at least yes. today you give us a summary how to approach and how to manage uh, the initial presentation of the diabetic food. Now, I think you prepared some quiz for the, our audience. So, so maybe you can just start the first one and then she will comment on it before going to the question. Okay. So please answer directly on your tablet or mobile or computer. Okay. I think you already mentioned this one at the beginning. Yes. I did mention the uh, percentage. So, and the... Yeah, sure. So to show us if the 60% reach, show us the, the result. Okay, so what do you think? Uh, good. <laughs> so it is 15%. So yes. what I said is approximately 15 to 25% will develop a diabetic foot ulcer. So 15% okay, is correct. Excellent. Next question. Two or four, every 30 minutes, limb is lost due to diabetes. Okay, the result, true. Uh, it's actually false. This was a, a trick question because yes. every 30 seconds, a limb is lost due to diabetes, not minutes. So you multiply by 60. Yes. So, <laughs> so by, by six, so 18,000 every 30 minutes. Yes. No, no, sorry, yeah, yeah, 60, yes. Yeah, every 30 seconds, you said. So every, every minute is two. Seconds. So yes. 60, 60, 60. Mm. Excellent, excellent. So let's go now. Uh, oh, there's another question. What does the monofilament assess? I think this one is easy also.
Yes. Correct. This is correct. Pressure sensation. You mentioned, I will take it, I will take it from here. You mentioned that monofilament is very sensitive. Yes. But there are a lot of, of patients who are actually having very hard uh, skin. Yes. And some of them, they have callus also. Yes. So yes. do you think that one is reliable for such patients? Uh, yes, but you have to avoid callus. Uh, I mentioned that avoid areas of callus. So mm -hmm. if they have, let's say, if they have callus on the first metatarsal, then you don't use that site. So okay. you use somewhere else. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's go now to the questions. Which is uh, better for tinea, cream or tincture, antifungus? Where is this question? In the Q&A box. So which one for tinea? Is it better the cream or tincture? Uh, it depends on the patient. There is no better. Um, whatever works with a patient. So you try uh, one type of uh, antifungal. If it doesn't work, then you move into uh, another type. But what I noticed from my practice is um, terbinafine was the most effective antifungal. The brand name is Lamisil. Um, I found it very effective for patients with tinea, stubborn tinea. But some patients, uh, even uh, Dactacort, uh, which is myconazole, it's uh, effective. It doesn't matter the formulation, if it's tinc tincture or ointment, whatever works with a patient. So, the other question, just to clarify, for children with type 1 diabetes, the guideline recommends screening these children at puberty or five years after diagnosis or at age of 10 years. Mm -hmm. Are you screening this patient and in which way? Um, the guidelines which we follow, which is the International uh, Working Group for Diabetic Foot, they recommend screening children uh, five years after diagnosis. So what's the question? Are you screening these patients? Yeah, we do screen if we get a referral. Uh, if we get a referral from the pediatric um, uh, from the pediatrics, then we do screen them. But uh, most of our patients are adults. We don't um, really, diabetic foot is not uh, very common in children. I mean, the youngest patient uh, I had uh, was around, uh, I think uh, 20, 20 something, 22 or 23. That's the youngest uh, with a diabetic foot ulcer. So it's not very common in children, but it's also good to uh, assess them and just uh, get them into the habit of uh, taking care of their feet since uh, since a young from a young age. Yes. The other question: If patient couldn't feel vibration, other examination normal? What is the next step? There is no next step. Actually, if a person, if you assess the patient whether they couldn't feel vibration or they couldn't feel the monofilament, there is no treatment for that. You just make the patient aware and you educate them. Uh, you educate them. You make them aware of their neuropathy, so they um, they take care of their um, their feet. And uh, also for you as a healthcare uh, provider, you, uh, for you to note down that this patient has peripheral neuropathy or loss of uh, sensation, so you can assess their feet more regularly. And just also adding to you, I think optimal control of diabetes yes, is very crucial. Of course. of course, yeah. So um, then severe tinea, Treatment, treatment, despite counseling and ointment, still patient have it. What are the oral medication? Um, we don't usually, uh, I'm not an expert in oral medication. What I do is I refer them, I myself, I refer them to the dermatologist and they decide which oral medication. So uh, I'm sorry, I cannot answer that question. That's <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. Is there a chance to refer patient with wound with prolonged period of healing from outside mustard to you? Yes, actually we receive patients from all over Oman. Uh, we receive from uh, any hospital or any polyclinic. Um, 
yeah so refer <laughs> okay, but, uh, but uh, we don't usually because uh, in all uh, wilayat uh, uh, um, they have a diabetic foot clinic so if from in a the health clinic, clinic the body yes. clinic Yes, yeah. so if, if the patient is from a health center, it is preferable if you refer them to the, your local polyclinic first, and then from the polyclinic, uh, they can refer to us. Excellent. So there are two people who want to ask by mic. Can we take uh, Hamid Suleimi? Hamid Suleimi. Yes. So, uh, Go Hamid. ahead. Please unmute the uh, mic. Maybe by mistake, you put the hand. Okay. So take Aisha, Aisha Labri. Aisha. Aisha. From the Aisha. From the Aisha. يلا شكرا شفتك رافع شفنا كيف صراف عيدك يعني حامد عندك سؤال ولا شيء ولا بالخطا خلاص ممكن بالخطا بعض بعض على اليد بالخطا so let me see the the, uh, the other places uh, the prevalence of diabetic force in type one versus type two diabetes and the prevalence in uncontrolled diabetes versus, versus controlled diabetes. Okay. Uh, of course, in uncontrolled uh, diabetes, it's uh, more prevalent, but uh, between type one and type two, two diabetes, there's no difference. It's the same. Uh, the prevalence is the same between type 1 and type 2 diabetes, and uh, but it is more prevalent in uncontrolled diabetes. Okay, does that answer the question? Yeah, it's clear. Okay. Uh, there is one question in the chat that I don't know if I read it correctly or not, Dr. Mukhtar, if there is uh lops i think he means uh, loss of pressure sensation should Protective. we refer for mm -hmm. for uh, doppler or brachial ankle pressure index i think uh, maybe it was not clear i think there is a confusion there loss of protective sensation has nothing to do with uh, a doppler uh, and ankle brachial index uh, a Doppler, if you cannot feel the pulses, uh, if you feel that there is vascular disease, okay, mm -hmm. you do a, a Doppler and then you can do the ankle brachial index. But if there is loss of protect, uh, protective sensation and you assess that by the monofilament or vibration, then there is no treatment for that. It's just for uh, your uh, the patient awareness and your awareness as well. Then what is your also experience on using olive oil and Vaseline between toes in diabetic food? First of all, we don't recommend using anything between the toes for patients with, whether with diabetes or without diabetes. We advise that the area between the toes to be kept uh, clean and dry uh, because this area is prone to uh, tinea. So I wouldn't recommend using anything, or whether it's olive oil, Vaseline, unless the patient actually has a tinea, then they have to use their antifungal medication. Other than that, the area should be kept uh, dry. Okay. Um, when to decide about the amputation? Where is the question? Is that a question or is I cannot? A question, a question. When they decide to amputate the limb or when to decide to amputate them, at what stage? Uh, at what stage? Uh, if, um, of course, uh, I do not decide for amputation. We have uh, surgeons who decide for that. Uh, we have combined clinic with the vascular surgeon 
and uh, usually from experience it's uh, patients who have um, uh, an acute infection uh, osteomyelitis um, or gangrene whether it's wet gangrene mostly wet gangrene that's when they decide for uh, amputation uh, if they feel that uh, I mean, the antibiotics will not work for that patient. That's uh, based uh, on the surgeon's judgment. Excellent, uh, Sam. I think we are getting at the end. So what is your final message to our audience who are staying with us until this late time? Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for uh, uh, attending. Um, and uh, I appreciate you staying until the end. Um, just the final message is that, uh, as I said before, and I emphasize is education is key to prevention. Uh, please check your patient's feet. Uh, don't bypass that. Uh, you will be surprised but by what you find. Um, at least once a year, you should do the foot assessment and also educate the patient about foot care. Okay, thank you very much, Hussein, for this very interactive session. And also to let everybody know that this session is uh, recorded and it will be soon, inshallah, at the YouTube channel for the Women Diabetic Association. And also, this is a lecture series, so please uh, follow us in our uh, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook to get to know about our next, uh, next session. Also, you can add your number to the, our WhatsApp group so our WhatsApp broadcast list, so we will get notified directly to your mobile about our next session or activity. So again, at the end, we would like to thank you for some Riyami, Pediatrics Admission Diabetic Center for your uh, for, for accepting our invitation and being with us and giving us this lovely talk to tonight. And thank also would like to th thank our sponsor, uh, Leading Company, Sharqiya Company and Body Royal. And of course, we would like to thank all our the participant who are staying with us until this time. Inshallah, we'll see you next time again in the next session and have a good night. Assalamu alaikum. Shukran Thank you.